One thing that makes our game device preview file a little bit different than what we've been working with so far is that in this one, we actually have some materials to look at. Everything's not just a flat gray. A material in any 3D software is telling the render engine how to bounce light off of the object. It tells it what colors to absorb or reflect, how shiny or diffuse it should be, or whether light should pass through it or bounce right off. So materials are really important in order to get the look of the object correct. So in this lesson, let's take a look at how we can add basic materials to our objects. Let's start out with a new file. I'll go to File, New, and General. And let's add a basic material to our cube here. To do that, we need to go to the Material tab in our Properties Editor. That's the little circle icon near the bottom, directly under the green triangle. It looks like it has a checkerboard on it. When you head to that tab on the default cube, you'll see that we already have a default material. Let's rename this material just so that we know it's ours. I'll call it Test Material. And let's change the color. There are a lot of settings here, but changing just a few important ones will go most of the way in making the object look the way that you want it to. So first up is the base color. Let's just change this to a nice blue. If we do that, then we're not going to see any change in our 3D viewport. That's because we're looking at the scene in solid view. To actually see this change, we have to look at the material preview or the rendered view. So let's switch over to the material preview. And now we can see our nice blue. Let's add one more object to our scene, just so that we can see the differences in materials a little bit better. I'll hit Shift-A, Mesh and Plane. I'll scale this up a little bit. And then I'll place the cube directly on top of the plane by hitting G and Z. Now let's give the plane a ground material. When we select it, you can see that it doesn't have any material. So we could either assign it the same test material that we gave the cube if we used the drop down here and chose test material. That'll give it that blue. And then if we were to change this color, it would change it for both objects because they're sharing the same material. But I'd rather it have its own material. So what I'll do is click the little X button to the right of the data block and that'll get rid of it. And then I can go ahead and click new to add a new one. This one I'll call ground. Then I'll make it a little bit darker than the default light gray. I'll make it a bit darker there. And I'd like to skip down through a bunch of these settings all the way down to roughness, because I think that's the second most important one here. This is going to determine how shiny or diffuse the object is. If we set this all the way to one, then it's going to be very soft and we won't see many reflections. But if we set this all the way to zero, then it's going to be very shiny and we can see crystal clear reflections. Well, of course, it won't be super crystal clear just because the background here is a little bit blurry due to the low pixel count, but that's just because it's the preview. You can see as we increase the roughness, those reflections get blurred a little bit until they're totally blurred out and we just see the base color. The next most important setting is the metallic value, which just tells Blender whether or not this is a metal. If we set it all the way to one, then it'll tint the reflections like a metal. And if we set it to zero, then it'll tint the reflections like any other object, like a plastic or rock or anything that's not conductive to electricity. It's a little bit easier to see on smoother objects though, that have a little bit more detail. So let's add a monkey. Shift A, Mesh and Monkey. I'll hit G and Z to bring this up. And I'll just place him right on the box, maybe scale him down a little bit. Put him right on top. And let's give him a new material. Or her, because I guess her name's Suzanne. And then click New. I guess that could be a guy's name. And let's call this Gold. Let's make a Gold Suzanne. So let's set the base color to gold, which is just a kind of lighter orange here, just like that. But in the viewport, this really doesn't look like gold that much. It just looks like it's, well, painted light orange. What really makes something look like a metal is how the reflections are tinted. So let's turn the metallic value all the way up to one. That's looking a lot better. To make it look even more interesting, let's lower the roughness a bit. All the way to zero is a bit too extreme, but maybe I'll set this to about 0.1. Now she's looking nice and fancy. So again, the three most important settings here are the base color, the metallic value, and the roughness. There are a lot of other settings here, and we'll talk about all of them in the fundamentals of materials and shading. If you've heard anything about Blender materials before, you might be aware that it has a really powerful node-based procedural system. And if those words don't mean anything to you, then don't worry. But if you're coming from another app and that gets you excited, let me show you that right now real quick. Editing our materials and this long list will only get us so far. The real power comes when we start working with nodes. To get to our node editor, I'll just go ahead and drag up my timeline here and switch it from the timeline to the shader editor. That way we can find our shader nodes. And if we zoom in here, you'll notice that we have a principal BSDF, which is our shader node, and we also have a material output. 
If we change any of these settings, it'll also change it over in the properties editor. So if you're already familiar with node-based systems, go ahead and look through the add menu and see what kind of nodes are available and start playing with it. But again, this is something that will cover a lot in the fundamentals of materials and shading, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself here. So I'll go ahead and change this back to my timeline and shrink it back down. Things are looking pretty cool with our super basic scene here, though I think I want to liven it up a little bit just by selecting the ground here, and let's make it a green for grass. It can be kind of a darker green, but I think that looks a lot more interesting. But whatever you decide to color it, one thing that it's definitely missing though is lights and shadows. It has some form of lighting, as you can see we have the reflections and things are somewhat shaded, but of course the monkey isn't really casting shadows on the cube, the cube isn't casting shadows on the ground, and if we move our light around then it's not going to have any effect whatsoever. That's because in material preview mode we've disabled all of those fancy effects and you can only see the reflections from the environment. And again you can change the environment if we go to the little drop down arrow here and switch out which sky we're previewing our materials with. We could switch to an indoor one or one of these others. and That'll definitely change the look of our material preview, but it's not going to give us completely realistic lighting. And if we were to go ahead and render this out with render and render image, or F12, then we'd see something completely different. That's because the material preview doesn't take the lighting into account until we tell it to. So we could turn it on under the viewport shading options and turn on scene lights or scene world, but what we'll go ahead and do instead is just switch over to our rendered view, and that way we can see exactly what will happen when we click render. Now when we move our light around, it actually has an effect, and we can see the shadow change in real time. This scene may be pretty basic, but let's go ahead and set up a simple three-point lighting setup so that it can look its best. First, when we rendered it out, we couldn't really see anything because the camera is in the wrong spot, so let's go ahead and position the camera a little bit better. I'll go ahead and scale up our ground plane here, and just zoom my viewport back a little bit, and then hit Control, Alt, and then 0 on my number pad, and that'll snap my camera to my view. Then I can just orbit my viewport away. And now when we render it, that's exactly what we'll see. Okay, so let's add a couple lights just to see how they work. First, I'll grab the default light here, and I'll use this as the main light or the key light. I'll place it in front of our monkey here and slightly off to the left and above. If we want, we can change the color in the properties editor. Under the light data tab, we can change the color, and I can make this slightly warmer or slightly cooler. And I can also change the power here. And I can also change the radius of the light, which will determine how sharp or soft the shadows are going to be. There are also a couple different types of lights that we can use. For the next one, let's add a spotlight. I'll hit Shift A, go down to Light, and let's choose Spot. Then I'll hit G and move this up, and let's place it right behind our object on the opposite side of the camera, and make sure it hits the back. I'll just hit R to rotate, and rotate my spot into the right place. If you want to change the properties, then you can go over to Spot Shape and change the size and how much it blends in or out. Right now it's not contributing much to the scene, so let's crank up the power a little bit. This might be a totally unrealistic value, but that's okay for now. We'll talk a lot more about things like that in the fundamentals of digital lighting. For now, let's just play around with the different kinds of lights. This one's nice because you can point it at whatever you want and anything outside of this cone won't be affected. Upping the blend is really nice so that it has a nice soft fall off. Next, let's try adding an area light. Shift A, light and area. And this one I'll just use as a fill light over here on the left. One thing that you can do if you don't want to hit R to rotate everything into place is you could also just click and drag this little gizmo, this little orange dot on the light. If I click and drag that and place it on any object, it'll point the light right at it. So if I point this at the cube or anywhere on the ground, then that's exactly where it'll aim the light. So that's a handy little trick. Area lights are cool because we can actually change the shape. By default, it's just a square, but we could also set it to be a rectangle, or a disc, or an ellipse. So pretty basic shapes, but still it's pretty cool. Again, let's turn up the power just so we can actually see the effects. And we may as well change the color just for fun while we're at it. It's pretty great that we can see all of these updates in real time. The last type of light we have is the sunlight. So let's add one of those. Shift A, light and sun. And this one I'll place just above. And this one, it doesn't actually matter where you place it because no matter where it is, it's calculated as infinitely far away. So the only thing that really matters is the angle. Here I'll just use this as another backlight, I guess. I'm pretty far off my default three point lighting setup, but go ahead and play around with this and just mess with all the different types of lights. 
One thing that you might be noticing here though, is that while we have a nice metallic monkey, it doesn't really have any good reflections. Again, that's because we have no real background here for it to reflect. We have some lights, but that's about it. Since we're using Eevee, it's not going to realistically reflect any of the other surrounding objects. There are some hacks around that, but again, that's a topic for another day. For now, let's check out what this looks like in Cycles. Let's head over to our render properties and switch our render engine from Eevee to Cycles. Now you can see the light is behaving much more believably, but it's still looking a little bit flat just because our environment is a flat gray. So let's go ahead and switch back to Eevee here and let's head over to our Worlds tab. Here's where we can change the color of the environment. I can set this to a pure black or a pure white or any color. If you don't have any image textures to use, you can always use one of the default sky textures to at least add some sort of sky. To do that, click on this little node input button on the left of the color, and then just choose sky texture. Now the default one isn't actually available in Eevee, so let's go ahead and switch this over to Hosek Wilkie. That's one that Eevee does support. And now we have a sky that looks kind of like the Unity background. If we click and drag on this circle, then we can change the time of day and where the sun is in the atmosphere. Let's see, the sun's over there. Let's change the strength a little bit. Maybe push it towards sunset. And now we have a nice sky. That definitely improves the colors, but still there's not a lot of interesting things for this to reflect. So let's add an image texture instead. I'll click on the sky texture over color. And instead of using sky texture, let's switch over to environment texture. This is going to turn everything pink because we haven't imported a texture yet. And so it thinks that it's missing. If you haven't used a high dynamic range image or HDRI before, then you can find them over on polyhaven.com. That's a great place to look for them. They have a ton of HDRIs that you can download for free and they're super high quality. If you end up using them a lot, then I definitely recommend contributing to them because they provide all of these for completely free. But go ahead and download one and I'll also include one in the downloads section of this course and then go over to Blender and go ahead and click open. Navigate to your HDR texture and double click it. That'll load it right in, and now we can see it in the background, and also it'll be reflected in our objects. Now we can't see it on our monkey because I think our roughness is a little too high, so let's go ahead and select our monkey, go back to our material properties, take the roughness, and set that all the way to zero. And if we look really closely, then we can see the background here reflected. Though of course usually we don't want the roughness to be quite that low, but I just wanted you to be able to see exactly what it's reflecting. Now, in Eevee, this works a little bit differently than in Cycles. So in Eevee, it governs the reflections for all of our objects, while in Cycles, it actually casts light onto all of our objects. So it's always going to be a little bit more realistic in Cycles, but it does help things look a little bit more believable in Eevee as well, just not to the same effect. Again, we'll dig really deep into materials and lighting in later courses, but now let's cover a few quick settings that you're probably going to want to change. First, if you're using Eevee, you'll probably want to enable Ambient Occlusion. That's over in the Render Properties and down under Ambient Occlusion. Just check that on, and now you're going to get shadows where surfaces contact each other. So if we turn that off, and we can see we don't get those shadows, and if we turn those on, then things are going to look a little bit more natural where two surfaces meet. If you want to change the settings, then we can, of course, expand this a little bit and change the distance or the factor. And this is going to help most scenes look a little bit better. Ambient occlusion is just an inherent part of path tracing and cycles, so in that render engine, you don't need to turn it on. But in Eevee, we need to add it on top. Now, next, we should also enable screen space reflections because right now we're just reflecting what's in the world. They're not actually reflecting each other. So to enable that, let's turn on screen space reflections. Now our blue cube is actually being casted onto our gold monkey and we can see a little bit of our gold monkey in the cube and things are looking way better here. Just be aware that this is going to be fairly limited because it's a screen space effect, but it's still going to be a lot better than not having any reflections at all. The other thing that you might want to change right off the bat is the shadow quality. So let's go down to Shadows in Eevee. Again, all three of these settings are Eevee specific. We don't need to change them in Cycles. But if we go to Shadows and we don't like how rough our shadows are, we can increase the cube size or the cascade size. The cascade size only affects sun lamps, so I'm not going to worry about it here. But I will change the cube size because it changes all of the other types of lights. So instead of 512, let's bump it up to 2048. And now our shadows are gonna be a lot sharper. One thing you might notice though, is that they kind of miss on some of these corners. You can see down here where our shadow doesn't really contact the floor quite correctly. If we switch over to cycles, then you'll see that we get an exact shadow. And as we zoom out, you know, everything looks natural and as it should. 
but when we're in Eevee, then some of those shadows might miss a little bit where they contact other objects. And that's why we have a secondary option for contact shadows, which does increase the memory a little bit, but it's almost always worth it to turn them on. So to see how this works, I'm gonna hide all of my other lights except for maybe one or two. I'll go ahead and just hide all of these lights here, not the ground, H to hide. And let's zoom in here on our shadow here, and I'll select our spot lamp, head over to my light properties, and under shadow, I'll turn on contact shadows. That will fix most of those issues. All of these different shadow settings in EV can be a little bit finicky, but again, we'll go over all of that in the fundamentals of digital lighting. You just might want to change the distance a little bit so it's not quite so chunky around some of these corners because it might look great from one angle, but not necessarily from other angles. So go ahead and adjust it accordingly. Change the distance and change the thickness until it's just right. Now when we hit F12 to render this out, we've got a scene with custom materials and custom lighting.